We, we talked a little bit um, at the start of the class on the history of the first law and the history of the second law. And then I kind of transitioned that a little bit into the history of atomic theory, but I think we rushed through it pretty rapidly. So what I'm going to do today, we don't have a tremendous amount of time, uh, but today I'm going to go over atomic theory and uh, the timeline of, of where that kind of was developed and a little bit of relationship to where the classical thermal that we've just finished discussing ends up. So atomic theory, if we discount the contributions of the Greek philosophers, uh, really found its very first concrete evidence, well not concrete, this is not really concrete, uh, indication that there might be something going on uh, by an individual named John Dalton, and to give you an idea, this is 1766 to 1844, so this is well beyond the development of the first law of thermodynamics. Um, what he found is that certain elements were always in the same ratio for different compounds. So for example, water, you could always tell that there was two hydrogen and one oxygen. Or different salts, you could always tell that there was one sodium for one chloride. So they could separate, they could break chemical bonds using electrolysis processes, but no one really knew exactly how it worked, what was being separated. The periodic table was just starting to be assembled. But the periodic table is just what are the possible elements, but no one had any idea what they actually were. Was it a continuous goop of material? Was it made of individual parts? It wasn't clear. So based on the fact that certain elements were always in the same ratio, John Dalton deduced that there may be some individual building block that is being separated and isolated for each of these different processes. Now the first really good theoretical evidence came from Boltzmann. Uh, so Boltzmann <clears throat> with uh, Clark Maxwell, so it's always Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions, so the two of them kind of came up with it a little bit in tandem. Uh, but this was development of the kinetic theory of gases. Two S, sorry, one on gas here. That's 1871, and this is with Maxwell, uh, James Clark Maxwell. They kind of uh, simultaneously. So what this describes is the velocity distribution of, of particles in a gas. Um, so what it did is it actually gave a, a framework for what temperature actually is, which is the kinetic energy of the gas. So then the question would be is if you knew that the velocity of the gas is corresponded to the temperature, you needed a proportionality relationship between the velocity of a gas and the energy of a gas. So the proportionality relationship was the Boltzmann constant. So the Boltzmann constant, we call it Kb now, is the uh, energy of one particle um, for, per temperature. So the units of Boltzmann constants is a very small number, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. So if you knew the temperature of a gas, then you could figure out what its energy was. Now the Boltzmann constant, I can never, ever, ever remember this number, and the great thing is I don't ever have to. Uh, the Boltzmann constant is just the ideal, con ideal gas constant divided by Avogadro's number. So we had an understanding at this point in time of what the gas constant was because we kind of had deduced um, how gases behave, how you compress them, how you expand them, how much energy it takes to compress them, how much energy it takes to expand them as a function of temperature. So we had a measurement of the gas constant, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And come to think of it, I'm not quite sure how they defined a mole back in the day. Uh, but the thing is, the main point of question was what Avogadro's number was. 
six point two times ten to the twenty three. <coughs> Now, oftentimes, when you see Avogadro's number, you'll see it as just reciprocal moles as the units. I like to always think about it as particles per mole, and then keep that unit of particles alive. What we'll find is that when we start dealing with statistical mechanics, uh, even if I give you an explicit equation, I just say, plug in these numbers to this equation. It's actually kind of tricky sometimes, because the units are very odd. Like Planck's constant is times 10 to the minus 34. Boltzmann's constant is times 10 to the 23, minus 23. You know, Avogadro's numbers times 10 to the 23. So if you get one thing wrong, you'll get your answer to like 10 to the minus 60, and you're, it doesn't make any sense, right? So it can be a little bit tricky to keep the units consistent. That's why I always like to kind of, when I think of moles, always keep particles per mole. So the real point of contention for Boltzmann was in this number right here. Since the Boltzmann constant was so, so, so small, that effectively meant that atoms were extremely small. And you had to have a tremendous number of atoms to make up one mole. So the prevailing theory at the time was that Boltzmann's mathematics were impeccable, and he could very accurately predict the properties of superheated steam, which no one else could predict the properties of. Now, why did people care about superheated steam properties? Electricity generation. Electricity generation, running steam engines, Right, powering the Industrial Revolution. If you could accurately predict the properties of steam, then you could very accurately design how should you depressurize high pressure steam to extract the most amount of energy. How do you accurately design a turbine? How do you, what temperature should you run your boiler at in order to get the most efficiency? So it was really amazing, but what people said is, that's a cool mathematical construct. Nobody actually believed that there was any truth behind this. So sadly, Boltzmann committed suicide in 1906. If he was a little bit more brushed up on the literature, Einstein in 1905 developed a theory for Brownian motion. So in the theory of Brownian motion, effectively what Einstein deduced is that if you had very small statistical fluctuations of particles, you could get the bouncing around motion of, of Brownian motion that, uh, oh, I can't remember his name, I should have written it down. Uh, I think he was a, a monk or something like that who looked at uh, pollen seeds, right? So if you had a particle, it would kind of dance around if you looked at it under a microscope. So Einstein was able to predict the path that you would expect, not the path, but the average mean squared displacement of that particle uh, using an idea that all of its motion was derived from small statistical fluctuations in the fluid properties. So in, in, in many ways, Einstein's theory for Brownian motion was another exper was an experimental validation of the idea that, that everything is made up of atoms. Now what really sealed the thing, so again, this only came out one year before, but, but uh, unfortunately Boltzmann had been sort of uh, ostracized and ridiculed because he he firmly believed that that, that was the, the reality of the situation. Uh, a, a French chemist or physicist, Jean Perrin, in 1908, He used Einstein's theory and experimental measurements of Brownian motion to accurately measure what Avogadro's number was just based on how much a particle danced around when you looked at it under the microscope. And that really sealed the fate that, okay, we actually have direct evidence now that uh, asphalt, uh, uh, atoms actually exist. Now, <clears throat> Now that kind of seals the fate that, yes, okay, atoms are a real thing. In 1889, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. He did this by using a cathode ray tube. So you had sort of a, a, a rod and a sink 
And uh, one of these was sort of very positively charged, one of these was very negatively charged, right? So the voltage was high. So that means that electrons would want to move over. And then if you place a magnetic field in the way, you can deflect the electrons. And so you could determine then that these were sort of particles that were shooting out of the cathode ray tube, and you could measure their deflection. This resulted in the plum pudding model. where we have a particle with just all sorts of different positive and negative charges just floating around. And that was an atom, or that was how matter was constructed, rather. Because at this point right here, we didn't know that these were atoms. This was just that elements were like a continuous slurry of positive and negative charges floating around. In 1911, <clears throat> Ernest Rutherford Uh, you did the gold foil experiment. So in this one here, they had an alpha particle that traveled through a thin gold film. And what was found was that almost all of them went through. And actually, on a whim, Rutherford told one of his graduate students to just, uh, I don't know, try measure, see if anything comes back. And as it turns out, every once in a while, an alpha particle was scattered or deflected back or at a different angle. So what this was used was to conclude that atoms are mostly empty space. In this case, atoms, OK. Timeline-wise, atomic theory had very, very briefly been introduced. So in this case, then, the, uh, the Rutherford-Bohr model, where we have positive charge in the nucleus, and then electrons floating around. This is the Rutherford-Bohr model. Then from 1920, basically onwards, it was a lot of quantum mechanics took over and dominated the discussion. So the Rutherford-Bohr. Rutherford contribution is the fact that atoms are mostly empty space. Bohr contribution, electron energy levels are quantized. So, you know, Rutherford could have imagined them as, as sort of a, um, a kind of like classical particles orbiting around the sun or something like that. So it's but it was, model, right? was that? Model. Something along those lines. So Rutherford didn't really necessarily know from his evidence what was going on. But with Bohr's work, Bohr was the individual who discovered the quantized energy levels of electrons. But quantum mechanics gets us into a whole other discipline. So to recap and summarize, unfortunately, we had a, a short day in class today. Uh, classical thermodynamics, what we're dealing with, or rather, what we are dealing with to this point, the first law <coughs> was developed from 1638 approximately to about 1840, and that's when I believe it was a Joule kind of locked in the interplay between electricity, potential energy, uh, and heat. And that was Joule kind of putting the last nail in the coffin on that one there. Uh, the second law saw its development from approximately 1850, about the era of uh, Clausius to about 1910, and this is a, something called the principle of Cathiodori, where you think about entropy as really more of a, a collection of axioms. To this day, people really don't have a concrete explanation of what the second law of thermodynamics is. Most undergraduate and classical textbooks rely on the notion that you can define entropy based on heat or pressure or these things, but in, in fact, that's sort of a cyclic logic. Entropy is a foundational principle of all of physics, but in order for us to really describe it, we always have to rely on something that's more intuitive. So entropy at its core is a strictly uh, mathematical way of visualizing things. And so by trying to understand how you can derive the concept of entropy based purely on a series of axioms, you can really distill down the fundamental principles of how the universe operates on a mathematical, 
basic level, and no one's been able to do it well. And there are papers that are still coming out to this day, you know, like 10, 15 years ago, that are just monumental undertakings. Axiom 1.2.7, entropy has to look like blah, blah, blah. Right, so people are still tinkering with it. But in terms of being practically uh, hammered out in terms of solving problems, that's about the error that we're looking at here. Atomic theory, no, so one other thing, so as an example, it's for like phase equilibrium. Uh, for phase equilibrium, you know, for powering, power cycles and things like that, we were getting pretty good over here if we had access to good experimental data. You know, Boltzmann used atomic theory to give us better estimates of the properties of materials. It allowed us to give better calculations for classical thermo, which allowed us to better design processes. But in terms of phase equilibrium, an example, Johannes Diedrich van der Waals, so our, our favorite equation of state author, <clears throat> he lived from 1837 to 1923. So this will be slightly disappointing. Uh, van der Waals, the van der Waals equation and derivation was his PhD thesis. So his PhD was the development of the van der Waals equation of state, and that was 1873. Now it's going to be a little bit more disappointing. Not yet, but I don't, I don't want anyone to get their hopes up on how well their, their graduate work is going to go. In 1910, he won the Nobel Prize. Not exclusively from the van der Waals equation of state, uh, but as a significant contribution. Nobel Prize in physics, by the way. So the level of complexity that we have to understand the real world, and of course we've gotten better at thermodynamics, right? There are equations of state that are exceptionally popular nowadays, like the Saft equation of state, as statistical associating fluid theory. This was developed by a gentleman named uh, Walter Chapman uh, at, uh, I think he was at Cornell at the time. Uh, this is about the 1980s. And this is a, a fairly robust model for associating fluids in the liquid phase. Uh, Peng Robinson, uh, SRK equation of state, those were established sometime in the 70s to early 80s, uh, especially when you know, oil companies were becoming uh, very large and very profitable. So that was the application there for, for those more advanced equations of state. So there are a lot of tinkerings and developments and whatnot. Uh, so in terms of phase equilibrium, we still had a lot to work out and hammer. And mostly it's just an ability to predict fluid properties. So now the main thing is how do we combine this? This is the foundation. This is what everyone has used to make millions of dollars, to make steel, to make steam, to make textiles, to power boats, to power trains. This works, right? People were making money. People were doing, people were, were very successful. And then, now we have this new theory that says, okay, everything here glosses over the details. Do we think that maybe if we integrate the concept of an atom, or the structure of an atom, or the behavior of an atom, can we use that information to rederive the foundation of everything that seems to work, and hopefully result in better predictions? And of course, we know that they did successfully do that. That is statistical mechanics. So statistical mechanics relates between the molecular scale and the continuum scale. But here's the problem. Do we have computers in 1911? No. How many particles are in a mole? A lot. Right? How many of you have a notebook that has 10 to the 23 lines on it? Nobody. So what StatMech is, StatMech is a really clever discipline where effectively you're, you're, you're more or less making a video game of how atoms behave. And what you do is you say, okay, I have a character, let's say it's oxygen. Here are the rules that oxygen has to behave under. And if I put one oxygen in a room, how does it move around? How does it behave? What's its energy? What's its pressure? What's its temperature? Okay, then I'm gonna take 6.022 to 23 of those ones, right? But the problem is every oxygen is stochastically moving around and it's random. But as it turns out, when you average out 10 to the 23 particles, they all behave collectively at a particular temperature or at a particular energy. The probability for deviating from the mean 
is exceptionally low. So StatMet is the clever mathematics of how do you combinatorially combine all of the distributions of all the different particles of all the different types to get one value for energy, to get one value for pressure, to get one value for the Helmholtz energy, something like that. All right, so that's what StatMech is. And this is all done before the advent of computers, so it's a little bit pen and paper heavy. Nowadays, modern StatMech is, is applied through computational simulations. And again, computer simulations are not good. I was just looking it up. The world's most powerful supercomputer right now can do 122 petaflops, floating point operations per second. That's 122 times 10 to the 15 calculations per second, which is still nowhere near close enough to model a mole of particles for even a nanosecond worth of time, right? Because 10 to the 23 particles is still 10 to the 8 seconds, which is a lot of seconds, right? So even modern computational calculations can only handle nanoseconds or microseconds at best. So the connection of StatMech from the microscopic world to the macroscopic world is still critical. And so the main thing I want to accomplish in covering StatMech is just to introduce everyone to the terms so that when you pick up a paper that talks about simulations or you pick up a paper that talks about um, uh, anything statistical or quantum, you have at least a library of terms that you've heard at least once. And that's sort of the objective here. Okay, have a good weekend. We'll talk more about StatMech on Monday. Thanks.